Thanks for joining us again on the show. Today, we have a very special guest, Dr. Ben Sessa, who is doing some work in England that you all might find very interesting. So he just got some funding to kick off the first ever uh, MDMA for addiction study. We get to get into that, and it's really exciting. It looks like it will be kicking off in the near future, and we should start hearing more from his team. And yeah, you probably know him because he's been all over the podcast and conference circuit. He had some really interesting things to say about how it's okay to make progress on the psychedelic front when it feels like you might be compromising your values to perhaps you know dress up and go to school and, and try to convince people uh, that you're authentic, even though you're not necessarily wearing your own authentic clothes. You know, So I think really the point is that we have a lot of stuff that we can do that really uh, it's a lot easier to do if we're dressed in business attire or you know maybe we have to cut our long hair temporarily just to get through something but it depends on what we're doing right if you're a therapist maybe it's not a big deal but if you're trying to get some really crazy project through a stodgy old government maybe you do need to do something like that so i hope you enjoy the show that's kind of um my idea of what he said in podcast interviews i've listened to with him before he said a lot of things though and I think you're going to enjoy it, and it looks like we're going to get him back on the show again in the near future. So I wanted to throw out a little bit of information about our sponsors. We are sponsored by TransZen, a product by Entheazen. It's a mood enhancement supplement that I've been using for a while. Same with Kyle. It's great. I think it's excellent for a day-to-day supplement. It's also a really helpful supplement if you maybe partied a little too hard or made a bad decision or two. So it's you know, something you could definitely easily take every day. And if you felt in need, you could take more. I think it's a really well-designed product. Caitlin Thompson, the designer and owner of the company, has a really interesting background in neuroscience and herbalism. So her composition for this thing is is really great. I'm very happy with it so far, and I wholeheartedly endorse it. So check it out. And if you go to her site, entheozen.com slash PT, you will get a free shipping offer. I believe it's only open to folks in the States. So sorry about that, but something you should check out. We are also sponsored by Bluebird Botanicals. Bluebird is a company here in Colorado making CBD products out of Colorado grown hemp. Hemp is grown using organic methods, and it's a great product, a great set of products. They've actually got a ton of stuff available on their site, including extracts. Uh, The last two weeks, maybe, I've been using this 6X extract. And it is wonderful. They have a line of different 6X products. Check those out. They also sell isolates. So if you wanted to vape or something like that, you could do that. I I don't know much of the science behind it, but that's an option too. And we've had some interesting debate on our website lately about what is hemp versus cannabis. And honestly, it's the same species of plant, just a different strain. It's cannabis sativa. And there are strains that have sub-regulatory limits of THC in them. So I think, I forget the numbers, like 0.3 or 0.03% THC in those plants versus, you know, the huge numbers you would see at a recreational or, or medical pot shop. It's a great company. I actually know a lot of folks there. When I was living in Boulder, I was friendly with uh, the CEO president and really good friends with their chief brand officer, Mike. And Lex Pelger now, formerly with Symposia, is also with Bluebird. And Justin Weiss, who, who you'll hear from from us in the near future, who's a Wim Hof certified breathwork instructor and a former member of the Naropa Association for Psychedelic Studies, um, who I met on stage, or sorry, I met him at a event Daniel McQueen was putting on in Boulder for a student panel. It was really great. And he's there as well. Um, a bunch of other folks I know. So I, I know a lot of these people personally. I vouch for them as individuals. I also vouch for the brand. It's a great brand. So if you have needs for CBD, check it out. They have their third-party lab results hosted on their website so you can check that out if you're uh, questioning what the potency of a certain batch is you know feel free and you know we're happy to answer any questions you have if you want to reach out to them i'm sure they will answer your questions as well and i think if you're in you know dire need um and you have some uh let's see financial restrictions i think they have some sort of assistance program so maybe check that out also i think 
you should be aware of a giveaway contest we're doing. So we love giveaway contests here. We love being able to give you all free stuff. On our site, we have a giveaway. We're giving away $350 worth of Bluebird product. And also the winner will receive a seat to our Navigating Psychedelics course. So please enter, share with your friends. Follow Bluebird on social. We really appreciate you all supporting us and our sponsors. So thanks. Please, please, please. If you know anybody that's interested in coming to Jamaica with us for our Myco Meditations retreat, please spread the word. We're going to be there May 16 through 23, I think. You can learn more on mycomeditations.com. We also have a few webinars coming up where you can ask us some questions for free about the retreat. If you want to just email us or have a quick call, let us know. Psychedelics today, email at gmail.com, mycomeditations.com. And uh, there's only a few weeks left for a live version of Navigating Psychedelics that Kyle's putting on. There's a few seats left that we're going to go through all the same content that was delivered in the pre-recorded version, but we're going to do classroom time as well so we can have larger discussions, discussions with Kyle and I, and it's going to be great. So if you want to learn more about that, check out psychedelicstoday.com and dig in. So without further ado, here is our interview with Dr. Ben Sessa. Thanks for tuning in. Bye. Welcome back to Psychedelics Today with Kyle and Joe. Today we are here with Dr. Ben Sessa. Thanks for joining us, Ben. Really excited to uh, learn more about you. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, it's a great pleasure to, to be on your project. Let's just kind of dive in and how did you get involved with working with psychedelics or what kind of sparked your interest to uh, get involved in psychedelic work? Well, I'm a medical doctor, which means I trained in medicine and surgery and then specialized later in uh, mental health and psychiatry. And then went on and specialized in child and adolescent psychiatry. Um, and I've been working with psychedelics in research capacity for about 10 years, 15 years. Um, and I first became interested in, in these compounds as a teenager. Um, and I was really interested in the whole culture that goes along with them, the music and the art and the literature. I was into the beat poets and uh, Leary and Ginsberg and from there I learned about Hoffman and all of these things so I, I, I was really interested in the culture and then um, in the early 90s when I went to medical school um, I was like 18 in 1990 so just when the rave thing was all happening and I was a DJ and I was living in London so obviously had a lot of exposure to ecstasy in those early years and, and then at medical school when I was studying mental health I would always um, ask my tutors about what they knew about the work done in psychiatry in the 50s and 60s. Um, Sanderson, Groff, um, uh, Osmond, and the various groups around the world that were using these substances in psychiatry. And none of my, none of my tutors ever could ever tell me anything. All they ever said was, no, you must be mistaken. Um, LSD is a dangerous drug of abuse. All you need to know about that is if one of your patients tells you they've taken LSD, then the correct treatment is to tie them to a table and then inject them with sedatives. You know, so, but I knew that there was a whole wealth of history with, with, with psychedelics and medicine, but it seemed to be just absent from the medical curriculum. So I wrote this paper in 20, um, 2004 when I was still a trainee, um, basically to bring to the attention of my generation of psychiatrists that actually these drugs have a really important history in medicine and then from there just it, it became really uh, I just got involved in the research community and at that time it was very small I mean it's much bigger now but it was very small and you only had to go to a couple of conferences and you will have met everyone there is um, and um, got involved in the research got worked closely with MAPS and met Michael Mithoff and Rick Doblin and and then joined the research department with David Nutt. Um, and then in the last 10 years have worked on, on studies with David's team with LSD and psilocybin and DMT and ketamine and MDMA. Um, receiving all of those drugs as a test subject as well as administering them to patients. Or, Which is or to, really fascinating. Well, yeah, it's kind of interesting. I don't think there's anyone else that's been, that's legally had all five of those. Various people have had one or two or three various different studies, but to have, to have been involved in all five 
um, is uh, is quite a feat. I think. And, I, and that was mostly for like the fMRI studies and um, right or yeah, for uh, they were all for fMRI or pilot studies before the fMRI were, was were, when we were doing dose response studies. Um, and then the MDMA was through the MDMA therapy training that I did in the States so as part of uh, the study we're doing now. Right. So I think the other thing in answer to your question of why did I get interested in it, so there was all of that interest in the substances and the culture. But then the thing, the things that, the thing that really fuels me now is um, having worked in clinical medicine for 15, 20 years and just seeing how ineffective the current treatments are and seeing my patients failing and not engaging with uh, recovery from addictions or losing their lives and taking their lives um, because the treatments that they're offered by traditional psychiatry are not effective. So that's what's really driving me, that I see that these these compounds offer us as psychiatrists the best option uh, for pharmacology that we've had in 75 years. Yeah, and you were relating that in a couple of your talks that, you know, MDMA is kind of like the new antibiotic for, say, psychiatric disorders, which is kind of yeah. interesting. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the analogy there is just about how in the 19th century we were losing the battle to infectious diseases in, in, in general medicine. And we were kind of very impotent and just in the dark as to why this was happening, didn't know about the microorganisms, had no conception of, a, of an antibiotic. But infectious disease was was rife and was killing people. And I think that's where we are today with trauma in psychiatry. You know, trauma is rife and it's at the heart of most mental disorders and certainly addictions and PTSD. Yet our basic tools to treat it are poor. We we treat it symptomatically with a, with a whole host of different um, medicines and a whole host of different psychotherapies. But for a large number of people with trauma, they cannot engage with any of those treatments. Um, but what MDMA does, unlike anything else in psychiatry, is it allows you to be with that trauma and not be overwhelmed by it. So it really offers a, an antibiotic type cure. And I think this kind of taps in also to this sense of helplessness that pervades psychiatry today, that we, we treat psychiatry and our psychiatric patients as if they're palliative care. You know, it's we, we've just got used to realizing that we never cure people. We just look after them. And I think we can do better than that. And I think uh, these drugs offer a cure, which is just an un, not a word we use in psychiatry. But right. it, it, it ought to be. It ought to be. There's no reason why we can't completely cure people so they just don't have to come back to us again. Mm -hmm. And I think the psychedelics and particularly MDMA are the best option we've had for this in, in the last 50, 75 years. Yeah. What's your take on, like, I guess the biochemistry model of like psychiatry using some of these, like, say, anti-anxiety, anti-psychotic medications versus something like MDMA, where it kind of elicits an experience where people are able to process trauma versus like maybe suppression or just a uh, symptom? Well, yeah, I mean, all, all of the drugs that we use in psychiatry, anti, um, antidepressants, anxiolytics, mood stabilizers, hypnotics antipsychotics, they all maintain a person by treating and suppressing symptoms, you know, which is not a bad thing, you know, don't get no. me wrong, that's, is, that's useful. Um, the analogy I often use when I'm doing my talks is, if you, um, if you have a fever due to an infection, you can take ibuprofen or paracetamol to bring your temperature down, and that's a good thing to do, you know, if your temperature comes down, you feel better, um, and why not? But Ibuprofen is not an antibiotic. It's not going to kill the bugs that are causing the, the infection. And I think that's what we're doing when we're using all of these maintenance drugs in psychiatry. We are quite appropriately treating the outward symptoms to relieve distress for the patient. Um, but we're not tackling the inner cause, the bug, the trauma. So the idea of psychotherapy with psychedelics is just a radical departure from that maintenance model. And, you know, I, I would be a hypocrite if I said I didn't use these other drugs. I, I use these drugs on my patients all the time. It's all we've got. Mm. But I think what, what this highlights is that psychedelic therapies are about psychotherapy. It's not about the drug. You know, people focus on the drugs and, you know, they even stigmatize it of like, oh, no, here's psychiatrists with more drug treatment. Everybody I know in psychedelic medicine is essentially a psychotherapist at heart. 
Um, we're doing it because we like psychotherapy, because we believe that talking therapies are the way to cure people. Um, but what we're doing is using pharmacology in a clever and focused way to provide a optimum piece of psychotherapy. But that's where the work's really done in, in, the, in the therapeutic relationship between the patient and the therapist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can really appreciate that. I, I feel like <clears throat> psychotherapy just gets a really bad rap, especially talk psychotherapy and kind of like a depth psychology kind of thing. I think there's a lot more we could dig into there. It's really hard to do science on it, but you know we're we're getting mm. there. Um, well, it's sort of one of those things that's hard to do science on, but it's not impossible. I think we're just not putting the money into doing it. You know, it's expensive to do. It's expensive to study, and you know the way that most human pharmacology research is carried out by the pharma industry because they've got a product to sell at the end of it. I mean. Who's going to throw forty million pounds at a psychotherapy study? You know the calc makers, <laughs> <laughs> like so they can sell calc. <laughs> you know it's like it, you you need to you need to do research that doesn't just isn't just goal directed towards a product. So the result is the research isn't done. I think it's perfectly possible to do the research. It's just the the drug model really suits funding from the pharma industry more so than therapy psychotherapy does but what's interesting is though although you say you know it's hard to quantify we all know when it works and we all know when it happens um and so for example just interpersonal relationships between you and your friends you know it works you know the value of interpersonal relationships um and maybe it's hard to quantify that but you we all know on a day-to-day -day basis that it's relationships that that make us what we are and make us happy, not not medicines. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, being in like the counseling realm, you know, I guess there are those evidence based practices that you know they they preach for you to use, and insurance companies want you to use them because they are somewhat effective, right? I mean, that research is happening within the counseling world, but not being heavily funded more like in medicine and science. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it is, like I said, it is research, and it's perfectly possible to research it. It's just, um, it's under-researched, yeah. because it's just expensive to do, and who's going to pay? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, so I'm interested if you're open to maybe diving into a little bit of your personal experiences. I was hearing you talk about, like, IV injection of psilocybin with the research, and having all these unique experiences and I thought it was really interesting that you said that IV like LSD has a pretty similar onset as in taking it orally and then psilocybin was like fast acting hits you really quick and then it also resolved within 45 minutes you you mentioned in a mm. talk somewhere yeah um that was really interesting because I don't think any of us were expecting to find that the, the psilocybin studies came first um and they were IV, and they're always IV because it's um, much easier to know you're delivering the drug in a in a standardised dose. And also, we wanted it to be short acting because you've only got you know you it's like five hundred pounds an hour to have the scanners, so you you want to get as much work done as you can in an hour. So, um, so we did those IV, and that's kind of like smoking DMT. It's kind of you're just straight at baseline, and three minutes later, you're tripping as hard as you've ever tripped before in your life in three minutes you know so it's it's kind of like like smoking dmt and that was iv but then when we came to do the lsd ones um it's it's a bit faster than all it might be maybe takes 20 30 minutes to come up as opposed to like half an hour or an hour and it's short a bit shorter it's might maybe like eight hours rather than 12 but essentially it, it behaves very like all lsd um which says that the delay is not about the drug getting into the brain. IV, the compound is in the brain within about uh, four four seconds normally. That's how long it takes to get from your arm to the brain, um, and uh, at, at the most four heart, four heartbeats even. So, um, but yet it still takes twenty thirty minutes to come on. Um, which is really interesting. And I think that tells us quite a lot about the pharmacology, the drug. Um, 
It also, I think, sheds a bit of light on a lot of urban myths. People talk about, you know, injecting it into their eyeballs or putting putting liquid acid in their eyeballs. I, I, I don't know whether we can, whether that's verifiable. Certainly, the experience that we had with all the subjects there was it was 20 to 30 minutes to come on when IV. So I think when you meet people that tell you, hey, man, I drip it in my eyes and I come on in two minutes. Do they really? I don't know. I'm not. I, I would suggest possibly not. They're telling porkies there. <laughs> But I don't know. People may, people may be, um, uh, may be having experiences that I didn't have, or, or the other subjects in this study didn't have. Um, I don't think I th there's something peculiar about LSD that it works in that way. Mm. You'd have to ask Dave Nichols about that. I have talked to him <laughs> about that. Um, um, I can't remember what he said. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to do that. That sounds yeah. like a great idea. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, because the visual cortex would be in the back of the brain, right? So it would have to somehow travel all the way <laughs> to the back from the eyeball. And that's a oh. little oh. absurd <laughs> <laughs> in some ways. Yeah. Um, okay. So are, are you excited about anything in particular that's happened in the last year or so in psychedelic research? Well, obviously my own research, um, because we've we've been um, setting up this MDMA study for the last two years, and we are now just on the verge of starting in the next couple of weeks. So that's obviously been the main focus of all my work recently. And what what we're doing is an MDMA study to uh, see if we can use MDMA therapy to treat alcohol use disorder. And what's interesting about this is that it's never been done in any addictions before. Um, you know, addictions and psychedelics with classical psychedelics has a very rich history going back to the 50s. Indeed, most of the early work with LSD was around alcoholism, you know, all the work coming out of Canada. Um, addictions were very much a big part of psychedelic therapy with classicals. Um, and then in the last 10, 15 years, all the work, pretty much all the work with MDMA has been around PTSD. But no one's ever proposed MDMA therapy for an addiction before. So this is the world's first. Um, and we're really excited about that because I work in addictions. And obviously, the reason we've chosen this is because, well, alcohol is a huge clinical and personal and societal burden um, that is absolutely ripe for something innovative. You know, if I look at, you know, the, the rates of relapse um, back to drinking after detox, after the best treatment medicine can provide for an alcoholic, rates of relapse at four years is 90%, yeah, which is rubbish, you know. We were doing better than this in the Victorian times 100 years ago. We, we really are doing no better than they were back then in modern psychiatry for a disorder that is incredibly prevalent and destructive. We need to do better than this. So it's an area where we need some innovation. So, um, it was it was where I really wanted to to focus in terms of the MDMA research. Um, so, like I said, most MDMA research has been focused around trauma, particularly PTSD. So, what we're doing is we're putting two and two together here because we know that alcohol use disorder is associated with childhood trauma in the vast majority of cases. So, whilst our patients don't have PTSD, I would argue they probably do have PTSD. They just have alcohol use on top. And that's mm -hmm. why they're drinking. So we're hoping it's going to work for that reason. Quick commercial break. This episode is brought to you by TransZen, a product by Amthiazen, a great mood enhancer and supplement that you really should check out. The ingredient list is wonderful. A lot of anti-inflammatories, a lot of B vitamins, and just a lot of great stuff that will help you get a more stable mood, especially if you've been partying or you're trying to prep for some kind of quiet meditation time, maybe take it a little bit before that. Say you did some microdosing, maybe your B vitamins or whatever is getting burnt off and you need to supplement, maybe this will help. I've done some pretty heavy duty <laughs> experimentation, we'll call it, and this pill has, or supplement has really helped me uh, recover. And my friends, I've tested a number of my friends too, and it seems like we're able to function pretty well when we're when we're on the product. So again, products called TransZen by Entheazen. Caitlin Thompson, a member of the psychedelic community, formulated it. So please do check it out. We appreciate their sponsorship, and it keeps this show going. So check them out. Thanks for listening. Back to the show. 
Was there any like questioning or pushback um, maybe among peers or where you're uh, trying to pitch this about using a potentially, you know, addictive methamphetamine derived substance to treat uh, like alcohol addiction? Um, no, because that's entirely wrong. Um, it's not derived from methamphetamine and it's not at all addictive. And, um, you know, there's if you look epidemiologically, MDMA addiction is just doesn't happen. I mean, I've I've had one patient in 15 years with an MDMA addiction and we're talking 750,000 doses taken every weekend in the UK for the last 25 years. Um, ask any psychiatrist, are your wards or clinics burdened by MDMA users? It's just not. It just doesn't happen. So MDMA addiction is doesn't happen. I mean, you, people can, can become habitually um, attached to MDMA at certain times in their life. They can get into raving and clubbing and take it every weekend because it's the habitual thing to do. But in terms of a physical dependency syndrome and a craving and a, and a, a, a craving to and drive to use the drug to the exclusion of other things, daily dosing and all of that sort of stuff that you see with addictions, it doesn't happen with MDMA. So whilst, and you know, it's an interesting point you make, it's, uh, it's, I guess when it comes to molecular science, one tiny side chain can completely change a molecule. Mm -hmm. So the fact that it, it's called 3,4-methylindioxymethamphetamine, it really does not behave in any way like methamphetamine, including its, its toxicity and dependency. So going back to the question, what do my colleagues think? Well, it's quite interesting because when I'm sort of um, giving lectures and I'm slagging off traditional psychiatry and <laughs> I, I never I never once have I had a psychiatrist stand up and say, actually, you're wrong. Or what are you talking about? Our treatments are really good. <laughs> you know, um, we all in psychiatry recognize how bad it is. Um, it's interesting because psychiatry itself often gets criticized as if we're doing all these awful things. I don't know anyone who is more self-critical about psychiatry than the psychiatrist <laughs> itself. You know, we are a very open profession to recognizing our limitations so by that same by by that same measure contrary to what people might think we've actually most psychedelic research is hugely embraced by psychiatrists and the profession because they rec they understand the relative safety and low toxicity of these compounds and they understand the desperate need for something innovative so um yeah it's it's generally very supported by colleagues that's refreshing to hear yeah it's good i mean I, I guess one way of thinking about this is when I do talks on psychedelics, I very rarely get a question that's difficult um, because what the, the objections that people have are so um, ill-informed that, you know, sometimes I get a really difficult question from the floor that I haven't thought about. But most of the objections are so um, ill-informed that it's very easy to answer them. Um, you know, in some ways, the, there's been a tremendous success of the war on drugs as a propaganda machine um, to have been able to convince, you know, two now and maybe almost three generations of people that the word LSD means harm. Um, yeah, we have been lied to by successive governments, lied to as simple as that, being told mistruths about these compounds um, with no pharmacological validity. Uh, it's outrageous. And, and you do come across, you know, intelligent people. I mean, sometimes a doctor would stand up and say, like at a conference and say, you know, but isn't LSD dangerous? You know, and it's like, well, and I would just say, can you show me the data? Because I've not seen it. <laughs> <laughs> but I had a conversation uh, with a psychiatrist. Huh? Go ahead. Sorry. I had a conversation, had a conversation with a psychiatrist about um, <clears throat> psychedelic psychotherapy. And he was blown away that I, I didn't believe that there were reasonable uh, PTSD therapies uh, available right now. Mm. And um, his, his kind of like justification was, if we get to the person soon enough, we can, we can really help. I was like, well, yeah, that's not really the case. That doesn't really help soldiers or, you know, sex mm. workers or children, mm. you know, in well, a lot I mean, of cases. In a, way, in a way, I can see where he's coming from. Um, and like I said, I, I would never say that all psychiatric treatment is useless. Um, I think with PTSD, for example, it has a 50% treatment resistance. Yeah, So that does mean it has a treatment effectiveness in 50%. 
So, yes, CBT, SSRIs, all these things have their place and they do work for a significant number of patients, but they don't work for an, another significant number. And in 50 percent of cases, it becomes a chronic um, longstanding illness. And um, so he's right to, in some extent that it's not like there are no reasonable treatments, but there's a significant hardcore, almost 50 percent for whom none of these treatments have worked. Um, and so I'd be surprised that he didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> is alcoholism uh, at similar rates in the UK compared to US? Like, I imagine so. Um, but, um, I don't know. Uh, I'd imagine so, yeah. I mean, in the, US, in the UK, we've got um, around 25% of people who drink, drink harmfully. So they're not, they're not quite at the level of um, daily dependent drinkers. That's around about four to six percent, which is really high. Um, but twenty-five percent of people drink harmfully. Um, so it's it is you know, and we've got we've got about fifteen thousand deaths a year from alcohol, mm -hmm. um, and then of course it's related to lots of other things as well. Completed suicides: ninety-five percent of people have alcohol in their stream. Uh, car accidents, domestic violence, sexual assault. Alcohol is implicated in all these things. So it's a very pervasive problem. Mm. Yeah, it's tough. And, um, it's, um, and it's actively pushed, peddled um, on the people, you know, mm -hmm. really, really strongly. And I think, I think we're worse in the UK in terms of how endemic it is in our culture. You've got, you have a more sensible attitude than we do. You know, we are, we stand alone in the world from what I can see in terms of, it being so normalized you know <clears throat> yeah I, I hope we can work towards the day where an mdma is peddled that way <laughs> be a lot more fun <laughs> um, so uh yeah go ahead no 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 go on. I, I also was um kind of curious about recruitment for your study do, do you expect any kind of serious difficulties getting people enrolled or um well if there's anything i know it's britain's like alcohol and mdma so, um, it, uh, well, we're, we're, we're involving people who are seeking support for, uh, alcohol dependence, um, who are seeking a community detox and in Bristol here, they have about 450 community detoxes a year and we need 20 patients over two years. So we're yeah. hoping to be able to recruit from this pool of people who are seeking community detoxes. Um, so that almost sounds easy, but the thing about all research is you have you're looking for this very specific population of people who are just ill enough in the way you want them to be ill but not too ill so they fall outside your inclusion criteria so you know we need people who are not dependent on other uh, are primary dependence on other drugs not on certain medications no cardiac disease no personal family history of psychosis and once you start adding all of these inclusion and exclusion criteria in, it really whittles it down. So we're not sure how recruitment's going to go. We think we don't think we're going to have a trouble with people coming forward wanting to be in the study, but it's just will they be excluded on all these other factors? So I, I think we'll have to wait and see. Right? Is there a timeline of how long they've had to have an alcohol addiction? No, no. They have to have a a, a DSM five primary diagnosis of alcohol addiction but um there isn't a timeline on that yeah i you know, think alcohol you can become physically dependent on alcohol in four weeks um takes about 12 weeks to become physically dependent on heroin so mm. alcohol is pretty quick in terms of developing a physical dependence yeah it'll be interesting to see how that plays out because i think i know the nyu team they've been having kind of like a slow ad, um, admission for their addiction and psilocybin treatments yeah I mean, it all depends on how stringent you are with inclusion and exclusion criteria. You know, it's like I said, I don't think there's going to be any shortage of people putting themselves forward. But it's the question of how many do you have to screen and how many do you exclude before you get ones that fit all the criteria. Mm -hmm. How does your funding structure look like? Is it NHS and Hefter or um, Beckley or? No, it's all come from a private philanthropic donor. Nice. Oh, that's fantastic. A single individual. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, um, really good. I mean, it's interesting how that came about. Um, I was putting together a different study. We were going to do a study in Cardiff with MDMA and PTSD 
you're using imaging, neuroimaging to look at patients in a scanner on MDMA. And we were looking around at funders and a friend of a friend put me in touch with this person and said, you know, this person's quite rich and uh, you might be able to get some money out of them. So I went out for dinner with him and I said to him, we're looking for £50,000 for this Cardiff study. And uh, he said, um, and he'd, he'd sort of looked at my work and he'd seen, he'd been following what I'd been doing and, and publishing. And then he said at the end of the meal, look, Ben, um, I've decided I'm not going to give you 50 grand for your project. And I said, OK, no worries, man. Thanks very much. It was a nice meal. Um, he said, how would you like 200,000 pounds a year for three years? Whoa. And, and, if you, <laughs> and if you had that sort of money, what else could you do? And, and it's at that point that I said, well, the study I've always really wanted to do is an addiction study with MDMA. And so that's and he said, great, go for it. So, yeah, it was I mean, you don't say no to that kind of offer. No, <laughs> that's pretty awesome. That's wonderful. <laughs> Um, so Ben, we're coming up on 30 minutes here yeah, I mean, um, right. and I know I'm you've right got to run. Keep, I'm all right to keep going for a bit. <laughs> okay. Um, another sort and, of five, five minutes, 10, yeah, five minutes or so. Yeah. Do, do you have any other psychiatrist partners on this project? Uh, yeah. David Nutt is a professor of psychiatry. He's a supervisor. Um, we've got a psychiatrist, um, locally who's, who's, uh, part of the local health authority. So he's very helpful. Um, there's my co-therapist, Laurie, is a um, clinical psychologist. So we're using the kind of MAPS model of the male-female dyadic pair. Um, um, I mean, all of my all of the psychiatrists that I know locally are very supportive of the project, which is good. Mm. But it's a multidisciplinary team. So we have nurses and we have a psychotherapist and psych clinical psychologists. Yeah. What's your hypothesis on, like, possible outcome of this study? Well, that's a good question. So because this is what we call a proof of concept study, you know, it's never been done. It's never been proposed that it's not a double blind placebo control study. We're not randomizing. We're not blinded at all. They all know they get MDMA. We all know they get MDMA. So our main outcomes are safety and tolerability. That's the main question. Our primary outcome isn't even drinking behavior. Okay. Um, the frame, I mean, I was talking to David about this the other day, and he said, look, if you can give 20 people with alcohol dependence MDMA and nobody dies, that's great. <laughs> he, said if, he said if a few of them at the end of the study don't drink as much, that's a bonus. But that's not what we're really looking at in this study. It's a safety and tolerability study. Now, we are, of course, looking at a whole range of measures. We're looking at mental health, physical health measures. Uh, we're looking at ECGs and bloods. We're looking at quality of life, relationships, finances, sleep measures, and of course, how much they're drinking, whether or not they've relapsed or not. So a whole range of measures, some that are typical for addiction studies or alcohol studies, some that are typical for psychedelic studies. Um, now, if this works and we, and so we got positive results, we won't be able to separate whether that's the MDMA or just the wonderful therapists. Um, right. Which, but, but but that's fine because we then go on and do a double blind placebo control study. So this is typical. I mean, all of those other studies, all of the um, all of the clinical studies that are double blind, always start in this fashion with a single uh, 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 an open label um, mm -hmm. safety and tolerability study because it's so novel. I think a really interesting thing to add here is when you look at these this history, as I said, of classical psychedelics in addictions, whether it's Bogenschutz and Johnson or the work of Griffiths or, or Kropitsky with ketamine in, in modern times, or going all the way back to Osmond in, in Canada in the 50s, what, these, what they all found was with classical psychedelics, the patients who had the most mystical, spiritual, mind-blowing communion with God had greater rates of abstinence. So it's like you need this profound mystical experience. And indeed, Bill Wilson, who founded AA, had about five or six LSD experiences. And when he wrote the 12 steps and talks about the higher power, he meant LSD. Now, that's been kind of watered down by AA since then, and it's no longer mentioned. But essentially, psych classical psychedelics induce this mystical experience. Now, what we know about MDMA is it doesn't often do that. About 10 to 15 percent of first time threshold dose MDMA users will report um, 
a uh, mystical experience. But that's compared to the 80 to 90 percent that LSD or magic mushroom users will use. So in some ways, maybe our study won't work because we're not going to be inducing this godlike state. Right. But, but what we have to our advantage um, and our rationale is we know MDMA works really well on trauma. And we know trauma is prevalent in addictions. So we're putting those two hypotheses together and hoping that this will work for those reasons. Mm -hmm. But a caveat to that is, and this is a personal theory of my own that I, I want to see if we can test somehow. My theory of why only 15% of MDMA users report a godlike experience compared to 80 to 90 of, LS, of LSD is the way that the drug's taken recreationally. If you look at the way people take LSD and magic mushrooms recreationally, it's pretty close to the way we use it clinically. You know, you just sit in a darkened room around a candle listening to Pink Floyd with two or three people. Yeah. Whereas when you take MDMA, you go to this crazy club and you dance and you have lasers and you drink and you have sex and you shout and loud music. And it's all externalizing party behavior. If you take MDMA in a darkened room with two or three people around a candle listening to Pink Floyd, I reckon you'd get more mystical experiences. So it's, it's highlighting quite an interesting phenomenon, which is recreational classicals use is similar to clinical classical use, but recreational MDMA use is not similar yeah. to clinical MDMA use. So I think that's going to be interesting to see how that works out. And also, I think nowadays more and more people are taking MDMA in this sort of quasi-clinical way. You know, people still party, and the, the amphetamine element of the molecule does lend itself to this shout a lot and dance a lot and party a lot, more so than classicals. But I think increasingly, you're hearing more and more people who take MDMA just within couples and just sit at home. And, you know, and I think that we're, we're moving away from that party hedonism aspect of MDMA. Mm -hmm. And I think we're going to see more anecdotal reports of positive experiences that are pseudo or quasi clinical. Mm. I have a question. Have you heard of uh, Carla Clements, who is kind of a PI or part of the MDMA trials in Boulder? Uh, phase I two, have, I think. Yeah, I have. She's now the PI on this extended state DMT uh, research that's in a proposal phase. Have you heard of this? No. Where, 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 which, is, this, it's, is this Hefta or Matt? No, uh, it's not funded yet. <laughs> okay. Um, so they're, they're working on the protocol. She's been designated the PI. This gentleman, Danny McQueen in Boulder, who's a Naropa trained therapist and does a lot of uh, cannabis work. Uh -huh. It has like kind of dreamed it up and expanded it. We're, we've we've partnered with them a little bit. Okay. We're just curious, like if you have any thoughts or I don't know initial commentary on on um, being able to do IV DMT for I don't know hours or mm. or days. Um, well, in a way, that's what ayahuasca is, isn't it? That it's a form of DMT that lengthens the experience, so it's not just twenty minutes, and it's and you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of clinical work being done with ayahuasca now, um, mm -hmm. especially in Brazil, um, including an alcohol study that they they came and spoke came over and spoke to us about it because they they modelled some of it on our protocol. It's hard to imagine how the DMT state in 15 minutes can be that you can do a great deal of psychotherapeutic work in that space. It doesn't even matter if you don't do it in the space. You People talk afterwards about how it was beneficial and positive. But um, the idea of prolonging the DMT state is really interesting. So I don't, I don't know about this study you're describing, but, you know, it, it, that's what ayahuasca is, in my experience. It's, it's, a, it's a way of prolonging it from 15 minutes of intensity to six to eight hours of intensity. And in that state, you certainly can do psychotherapy. Um, I think what that highlights is, if you look, say, at the work that's being done with ketamine and depression at the moment, and there's all these clinics springing up, aren't they? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a little bit dubious about that because what most of these places are doing is they infuse you with ketamine and then you go home. They don't use that state to do some work like Kropitsky did in Russia, you know? Um, he used the ketamine state, the altered state of consciousness, to do psychedelic therapy. Um, and, I, and a lot of these ketamine projects are not doing that. 
but uh, what I suppose what that's showing is that even if you don't do psychotherapy with the drug, just having the drug experience and not actually doing any psychedelic therapy in the non-ordinary state can still be beneficial. But I think it could be even more beneficial if you do some work in the state. Definitely. Um, so if I was to go to a ketamine infusion clinic, I would say, don't just give me the infusion and then send me home. Talk to me while I'm in that state. Let's do some psychotherapy in that state, because then it's, I think, even more powerful. And you've had an experience of just having an infusion and leaving. I remember you were talking yeah. about it in the symposia uh, storytelling, yeah. I think. Yeah, um, that was at the Maudsley in South London. Yeah, it took me four hours to find the tube station. <laughs> it was only in the net. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's excellent. <laughs> All right. Um, um, so I, so I suppose we should wrap. I think I had better call it a day, but thanks very much, guys. Yeah, it was great chat. Yeah, Thank you. Really appreciate it, Ben. Thanks for your time, and uh, looking forward to connecting again in the future. Thanks again for listening to Psychedelics today. This is Joe Moore. Before I wrap, just a little more shout out here. So yeah, number one, if you want to help us out, check out our retreat in Jamaica. We're doing legal mushroom work down there. We're going to facilitate uh, as authentically as we can on a beach in Jamaica with really high quality mushrooms. If you're looking for any kind of exploration or you know healing from psychedelic states, perhaps this is the place for you. A lot of folks are going down to Peru, but you could have a much shorter flight and come over to Jamaica which is a beautiful place. There's no great reason to skip Jamaica. Jamaica is awesome. This particular place in Jamaica is quite magical on the South Shore, very remote, and everybody I've talked to loves the place. They are blown away. Hopefully you can check that out, michaelmeditations.com. If you have any questions, hit us up, psychedelics today, email at gmail.com. Another thanks to our sponsors, Transzen by Amthiazen, a mood enhancer supplement product that will help shorten your drug hangovers and quite possibly help you have a more stable mood on your, during your work week or when you're studying. Often a lot of stress is due to inflammation and they have some anti-inflammatories in there, herbal anti-inflammatories, some antioxidants, also some essential vitamins that you may or may not have gotten in your diet. So a lot of really valuable stuff in there and I really recommend checking it out. Get some free shipping if you go to entheazen.com slash P-T. That's E-N-T-H-E-O zen dot com slash P-T. Free shipping for those of you in the U.S. who uh, can benefit from some lax laws around um, this stuff. Apparently, we're unable to get this stuff internationally. There, apparently, there's a ton more regulation for us to get this stuff outside the States. So keep an eye, but uh, no promises. And yeah, thanks again to Anthea Zen for sponsoring us. And thanks also to Bluebird Botanicals, a CBD manufacturer out of Colorado. I know a lot of these folks. They're great. They make very high-end CBD products from extracts to concentrates to isolate. So like a powdered CBD. Uh, this all comes from hemp. So it's still cannabis sativa. It's just very low in THC. And it's legal. It's legal in all states in the U.S. except for South Dakota. They're able to ship to every state, including Hawaii and Alaska, but not South Dakota for whatever reason. Apparently, there's some sort of CBD ban who, whose nature I do not understand. I would love to understand it a little bit better. So if anybody wants to clue me in what's going on in South Dakota, hit us up. Psychedelics today, email at gmail.com. Thanks again for tuning in, everybody. We really appreciate it. Hope you have a, a great rest of your week. <laughs>